promise to forgive all who come before him with true contrition and seek his mercy. Through and in Jesus, we have the ability to do this. And when we do, we allow God to recreate in us, to do something new in us. Our entrance hymn is number 125, led by the Spirit, number 125. Please stand. Led by the Spirit of our God, we go to fast and pray with Christ into the wilderness. We join his Paschal way. Rent not your garments, rent your hearts, turn back your lives to me. Thus says our kind and gracious God, whose reign is liberty. Led by the Spirit, we confront temptation face to face, and no full well we must rely on God's redeeming grace. On bread alone we cannot live, but nourish by the word. We seek the will of God to do, this is our drink and food. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. My friends, let us call to mind our failings so as to prepare ourselves to celebrate these sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty, Almighty God, God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever-Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Kyrie eleison. Kyrie Christ eleison, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison. Let us pray. By your help we beseech you, Lord our God. May we walk eagerly in that same charity with which out of love for the world your Son handed himself over to death. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, who opens a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters, who leads out chariots and horsemen, a powerful army, till they lie prostrate together, never to rise, 
snuffed out and quenched like a wick. Remember not the events of the past, the things of long ago consider not. See, I am doing something new. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? In the desert, I make a way. In the wasteland, rivers. Wild beasts honor me, jackals and ostriches. For I put water in the desert and rivers in the wasteland for my chosen people to drink. The people whom I formed for myself that they might announce my praise. The word of the Lord. The Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. The Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. When the Lord brought back the captives of Zion, we were like men dreaming. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with rejoicing. The Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad indeed. The Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, O Lord like the torrents in the southern desert. Those that sow in tears shall reap rejoicing. The Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. Although they go forth weeping, carrying the seed to be sown. They shall come back rejoicing, carrying their sheaves. The Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Brothers and sisters, I consider everything as a loss because of the supreme good of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have accepted the loss of all things, and I consider them so much rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having any righteousness of my own based on the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God, depending on faith to know him and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by being conformed to his death, 
if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. It is not that I have already taken hold of it or have already attained perfect maturity, but I continue my pursuit in hope that I may possess it since I have indeed been taken possession of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I, for my part, do not consider myself to have taken possession. Just one thing, forgetting what lies behind, but straining forward to what lies ahead. I continue my pursuit toward the goal the prize of God's upward calling in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Christ, King of endless glory. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Even now, says the Lord, return to me with your whole heart, for I am gracious and merciful. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. But early in the morning, he arrived again in the temple area. And all the people started coming to him. And he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and made her stand in the middle. They said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? They said this to test him, so that they could have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and began to write on the ground with his finger. But when they continued asking him, he straightened up and said to them, Let the one among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he bent down and rolled on the ground. And in response, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. So he was left alone with the woman before him. Then Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She replied, No one, sir. Then Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, do not sin anymore. The Gospel of the Lord. Friends, peace be with you. If you've ever seen the movie Mr. Holland's Opus, it's one of those movies for me personally that had a big impact in my life in an important time. Um, it tells the story of a man named Glenn Holland. And Glenn is at an impasse in life because he'd always figured that he'd be in a rock and roll band and making all kinds of money um, on the top 40 
writing songs. You can tell that writing is a passion of his, but it didn't work out that way. He never got in a very successful band. And so as he's just married this new, or his wife, uh, they decide that they need to make some money. So he does what was supposed to be a fallback occupation for him. He kind of has the attitude that people think about teaching, which is those who can do and those who can't teach, which generally is a pretty good formula for a failed teacher, to be honest with you, because if you're not passionate about teaching, you're going to be bad. And that's what happens to Mr. Holland. He walks into the high school that he's at, and it's very 1960s, early 1960s, uh, before the rebellion of the later 1960s and 70s, um, and all kinds of paradigmatic scenes, but the, the one that comes immediately to mind is he gives his first test, and he's very frustrated at home with his new wife who finds out that she's pregnant and all kinds of things, and he goes back and he says, name, one of the questions was name three American composers, and one writes Johann Sebastian Bach, the great German medieval composer. And clearly the person had no, I think they even write so, Johann Sebastian Bach question mark, which is whenever you put a question mark on a test, that's a mark of confidence right there, right? He realizes he's just not connecting with the students for one reason or another. And so he says, I need to do things different. I need to start new. Let's start afresh. And he walks over to the piano and he plays this song and he says, who wrote this? And they said, well, it's called Lover's Concerto. And he slams the piano bench down, or the, uh, the uh, front of the piano down and goes, wrong. It's written by Johann Sebastian Bach. It's just that it was redone in the 1960s as a pop song called Lover's Concerto. And he says, I want to show you how classical music is not dead, but that it is the fabric through which pop music, through which all music comes, that it has its roots in other places, and we need to look what those roots are before we just die. It was, for him, a way of doing things new. Now, he didn't rewrite music. He didn't rewrite an entire curriculum. He just knew with this group, he needed to start anew, and that they needed to start anew, to hear music in a new way, that it wasn't just something that was fun to dance to or something that you can bob your head to. It had to be something that they could connect to in a different way, in a new way. I make all things new, says the Lord in chapter 42 of the book of Isaiah. So what do we do with the first 41 chapters if he's starting all anew? Well, it's again, I don't think that the Lord is saying we're going to rewrite all of Judaism. In fact, we're going to change Judaism's name to something completely different. We're going we're to rebrand it. No more of the, the rules and laws of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. We're just going to do all things new. No, that, that couldn't be any farther from the truth. To understand how we're going to do things anew in chapter 42, you have to understand something about the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is a uniquely uh, Lenten book. I think it's good for us to reflect upon it because there are sort of three different visions. We like the number three in Lent, prayer, fasting, almsgiving, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Um, there are these three visions of the book of Isaiah. The first one happens chronologically first as well. And what's happening is Isaiah looks out toward the east and he says, you see that army that's coming over there, those Babylonians that are coming? We can't defeat them on our own. We've wandered far away from God, and now is the time for us to return to the Lord, ask for God's assistance, and if we do, God will protect us. So let's all pray, let's all return with fasting and almsgiving, turn our hearts back to the Lord, let's do it. The second scene is, okay, we didn't return to the Lord, and now we're all in exile in Babylon. They came and they ruined us, and it's all your fault, and it, I'm going to tell you again, return to the Lord, and maybe he'll let us go back, and this is all your fault. The third of Isaiah is what we start today, and Isaiah says, okay, now the Lord is saying, I'm going to do things new. It's not that Isaiah, Isaiah is going to rewrite the entire New Testament or throw it out. It actually is more about us doing things new. The Jewish people, the Israelites, needed to do things anew to return to the Lord like they had never done before, to be obedient to God's law, to be in right relationship with God. And when that happens, God says, this is new, isn't it? 
now let's go back to your home. And it'll seem like a whole different place when you worship me in spirit and truth. And that's exactly what happens for the remainder of the, the book of, of Isaiah. It's them returning to the Lord and, and cautioning themselves not to slide back in. So it seems to me like something similar is also happening in our gospel today. This emphasis of doing something new. The story of the woman caught in adultery is, is one of those stories that really captures my imagination. Imagine Jesus is just standing there and suddenly the circle of guys is surrounding him and the, a woman is thrown in the middle of them and she, they say this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. Now, it takes two to tango here. Where's the dude? Where is the guy that was caught in the act of adultery? Not mentioned. I kind of wonder if he was there with them too. Kind of like, yeah, she was a caught in the act of adultery with me. But it's her, you know. <laughs> well, let's go get her. And so they all gang up. And then Jesus acts disinterested and they say, well, what are you going to do about this? And twice he bends down and starts writing in the sand. Some theologians think that the second time that he starts writing in the sand, he writes, so Judas, um, you stole money from the treasury. And I know that you did, and I'm going to wipe that out. And then he takes his hand and he wipes out the sin. And as Judas looks down and realizes Jesus knows that he did that, he walks away because he realizes that Jesus has just forgiven him that. Oh, yeah, and Eusebius, Eusebius, you stole money from the guy who's standing right next to you. I'm going to forgive that sin, and as is that person. And the two of them walk away. And over and over again, people come forward and they say, Jesus, you need to condemn this person. And you're the guy that was caught in adultery with her. And I'm going to wipe out that sin. And that person walks away. They realize that they have a chance to start things new, to start things afresh. But they need to let go of this fascination and fixation with vengeance that they have for this woman. Instead, they need to recognize that they've had things forgiven as well. Pope John Paul II recognized that we needed something new in the church as well. And it's something that we really are struggling to Im implement and inculcate. A new evangelization. He looked out at Europe and he looked out at the United States and North America and he said, there are people who have been catechized, who have been baptized, who have been confirmed, who have received First Eucharist and who never come to church. And in fact, are angry sometimes at the church. Sometimes justifiable, but most of the time they're either angry or indifferent. Indifference in particular. Because as we all know, it's so much easier to sleep in on a Sunday than it is to actually get out of bed and come to church. He looked out at that and he thought, this is a problem for us. We need a new evangelization. Again, not rewriting all the, all the laws, not coming out with a new Jesus smiling happy with thumbs up or something like that. Not, not kind of a gimmicky change, but a change of, of our hearts. And he said, we need to come up with a way so that our people can have this kind of change. I remember Monsignor Wilgenbush, he's helped a couple of times when I've been absent, uh, subbed in. He's uh, one that at a priest council meeting one time said, yeah, we can invite people back, but what are we going to invite them back to? If, if there's nothing that's going to help them to want to stick here into the church, it's just going to be a very short-term conversion. And so putting some flesh on what it is to be new. We, we can't just sort of have beer and pizza masses or something like that, as much fun as that would be, right? Um, we, we can't change those kind of core things. What can we change? Well, first and foremost, we can change our hearts. I know that sitting in front of the Blessed Sacrament in the Eucharist, one of the reasons why I emphasize this, this practice so much by trying to do it on Saturdays and, and other times throughout the week is because it does change our hearts. We get into a relationship. When I was at Laura, sometimes people would criticize Eucharistic adoration and say, well, it's just me and Jesus' spirituality. There's no community involved. Or, or else they'd even denigrate it in, in ways by calling it cookie worship, which I hated uh, because it's deeper than that. It's me being able to fall in love with the person who loved me first. You've got to get to know somebody if you're going to like them. And you have to like them if you're going to love them. And you have to, it starts with getting to know them. To me, that's prayer. And I, I, I think Eucharistic adoration is a profound way of doing it, but we can do it in many ways. One way that is important is to spend time with Scripture. I don't encourage, by the way, starting at the front of the Bible and just reading it all the way through like it's a textbook. Because you'll get into Deuteronomy and Leviticus and you'll hate the thing. 
it's like rule, 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 and the rules are broken up by list of names of people who begat other people, and you're like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. Uh, my suggestion instead is to look at the daily mass readings, which we have the citations in, in the Breaking Bread book. They're, they're also on the United States Bishop's website. To spend some time in prayer, encountering the Lord one-on-one, -on -one, getting to know the Lord. But you might say, well, Father, I do that. I have a, a time of prayer, uh, praying with Scripture every day. What, what else can I do? Well, I think the sacrament of reconciliation is one of the least used tools that we have. We, I, we, we just simply don't use it as well. And I know you're saying, um, I do other ways of forgiveness. And I, know, and I also know that for the past 30 years, all we've done is come up with reasons not to go to the sacrament of reconciliation. It started off by saying, well, you really only have to go once a year. But wouldn't we want more grace? Wouldn't we, don't you want to, do you, is there anything that you just do the least of if, if it's something you look forward to? Uh, it, the sacrament of, of reconciliation can be transformational if we don't just look at the least. And some people say, well, I do the confidior at the beginning of Mass, or I do the Lord, I pay attention to the Lord have mercy, and I think that I'm, yeah, I, I'm not saying that that's not forgiving, but there's something about being accountable at having to name our sins in the Sacrament of Reconciliation. Or, I, I get anointed once a year, and that sort of takes care of confession. Well, anointing is forgiveness, don't get me wrong, but it's supposed to be healing forgiveness, not necessarily taking the place of the Sacrament of Reconciliation, especially if you're able to do it. I encourage us to look at the Sacrament of Reconciliation, not as a punishment, but as an opportunity to, to be accountable to somebody else who is standing in the place of God, even if it's fallible old me sitting on the other side of that screen or in the other chair across from you. But being able to name those things and knowing that God has wiped them out. Also, then it will transform, I think, when we gather together as a community, listening to God's word and being able to receive his body and blood. If we do those other two things, it will have an impact on our life as well, on our life of faith as a body of Christ. Now, you might say, Father, I already do all of that. I pray every day. I approach the Sacrament of Reconciliation about every six weeks or so. I, I come to Mass, and it is meaningful for me. What's the next step? And I think about that person who maybe sends their kids to faith formation or sends their kids to Marquette School, but we never see them on a Sunday. And faith is important to them, but for one reason or another, they just don't come. Maybe it's because they don't know anybody there, and they need to start something new in their life. All they need is somebody to reach out to them. What if we called them up and, and, set, and just in the course of conversation, getting to know them, said, hey, would you want to come to church and sit with me? Because I think one of the reasons people don't come to church is maybe they don't feel like anybody cares if they don't come. Or if they do come, they're not going to know anybody and they're going to feel awkward because they have all of these new words that they just made up 10 years ago and I don't know what, how to, to say any of them and I get nervous. And, and if somebody was there to hand them a book and say, here it is, go ahead and read from here, it might make them feel a little bit more comfortable. A little evangelization, something new, some new evangelization that we can do in a small way. So as we journey continuously, but especially toward the end of our Lenten journey, one question that we may want to ask ourselves is, what is God calling us to do new? How is God calling us to live out our faith life as something new? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made for us for our salvation. He came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken to the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Knowing our God never abandons us and is always attentive to our needs, let us bring before him the needs of ourself and the needs of the church. For our Holy Father, our own bishop, and for all who shepherd the church, may they be blessed with God's Holy Spirit as they fulfill their vocation of leadership. Let us pray to the Lord. For all who lead nations and people, may God stir in them a desire that they might come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. For all who are sick and for those who have no one to pray for them, let us pray to the Lord. For families in this faith community, may the Holy Spirit strengthen us in compassion, love, and grace. Let us pray to the Lord. For those who remembered in this Mass who have died, Cletus, Lawrence, and Sue Deppe, Marvin Kiefer, and deceased members of the Jerry and Dee Ernst family, and for Sandra Drewy, who, would, who had died and whose funeral will be this Tuesday, may they come to dwell in the house of the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Almighty and eternal Father, you desire not the death of the sinner, but our conversion and healing. Hear these prayers that we make to you through your Son, Christ our Lord. Amen. Our song for the preparation of the gifts is number 431, Be Not Afraid, number 431. You shall cross the barren desert, but you shall not die of thirst. You shall wander far in safety, though you do not know the way. You shall speak your words in foreign lands and all. shall see the face of God and live. Be not afraid. I go before you always. Come, follow me.
Pray, friends, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Hear us, Almighty God, and having instilled in your servants the teachings of the Christian faith, graciously purify us by the working of this spirit of this sacrifice through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Spirit, lift up your hearts. We lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord Holy Father. Almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For by your gracious gift each year, your faithful await the sacred Paschal feasts with the joy of minds made pure. So that more eagerly intent on prayer and on the works of charity and participating in the mysteries by which they have been reborn, they may be led to the fullness of grace that you bestow on your sons and daughters. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. Holy. Indeed, holy, O Lord, and from the world's beginning are ceaselessly at work, so that the human race may become holy, just as you yourself are holy. Look, we pray upon your people's offerings and pour out on them the power of your Holy Spirit, that they may become the body and blood of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, in whom we too are your sons and daughters. Indeed, though we were once lost and could not approach you, you loved us with the greatest love. For your Son, who alone is just, handed himself over to death and did not disdain to be nailed for our sake to the wood of the cross. But before his arms were outstretched between heaven and earth to become the lasting sign of your covenant, he desired to celebrate the Passover with his disciples. As he ate with them, he took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, knowing that he was about to reconcile all things in himself through his blood to be shed on the cross, he took the chalice filled with the fruit of the vine and, once more giving you thanks, handed the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you 
come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Passover and our surest peace, we celebrate his death and resurrection from the dead, we look, and looking forward to his blessed coming, we offer you, who are our faithful and merciful God, this sacrificial victim who reconciles to you the human race. Look kindly, most compassionate Father, on those you unite to yourself by the sacrifice of this, of your Son. And grant that by the power of the Holy Spirit, as we partake of this one bread and one chalice, that we may be gathered into one body in Christ, who heals every division. Be pleased to keep us always in, commi in commemoration of mind and heart, together with Francis, our Pope, Michael, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember, help us to work together for the coming of your kingdom until the hour when we stand before you, saints among the saints in the halls of heaven, there with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, blessed Joseph, her spouse and our patron, the blessed apostles and all the saints, and with our deceased brothers and sisters whom we humbly commend to your mercy. Then freed at last from the wound of corruption and made fully into a new creation, we shall sing to you with gladness the thanksgiving of Christ, who lives for all eternity. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Write a thought for each other, a sign of peace. Stay, qui tollis peccata mundi, miserere nobis. On Jesus day, qui tollis peccata mundi, Serere nobis on your day, qui tollis peccata mundi, dona nobis pace.
Behold, the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word of my soul. Our song for communion is number 545, Sacred Silence, number 545. Sacred silence, holy ocean. As we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from of gold is dead and 
the dreams we've clung to, dying to stay young, have left us parched and old instead. When my courage crumbles, when I feel confused and frail, when my spirit falters on decaying altars and my illusions fail, I go on right then, I go on again, I go Tomorrow tumbles, and everything I love is gone. I will face regret all my days, and yet I will still go on. We pray, Almighty God, that we may always be counted among the members of Christ in whose body and blood we have communion, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Each month we remember those couples that are celebrating anniversaries of marriage, and so if you were married in the month of April, we invite you to stand, be blessed, and recognized by our community. Few of you out there. It's always surprising. If you're comfortable joining me in a posture of blessing, please do so. Lord God and Creator, we bless and praise your name. In the beginning you made man and woman so that they might enter into a communion of life and love. You likewise bless the union of these couples so that they might reflect the union of Christ with his church. Look with kindness on them today. Amid the joys and struggles of their lives, you have preserved the union between them. Renew their marriage covenant, increase your love in them, and strengthen their bond of peace so that they may always rejoice in your gift of blessing through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us celebrate these sacraments among us. And let us stand. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mass is ended. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. The choir practice for the Easter Vigil Mass will be on Wednesday, April 10th at 7.30 p.m. in St. Joseph Church. Our closing hymn is number 137, Lord Who Throughout These 40 Days, number 137. Oh. 